Good morning, everyone. David Moore, Equity Advantage, 1031exchange.com. Uh, just a couple minutes late getting started this morning, a little technical difficulties, but uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we've got an hour of great information, and we're going to talk about all things 1031 and Section 121. And, uh, you know, it might, might sound like it's sort of boring, but I, I think it's exciting, actually. So we, we like to say you've worked hard for your money. We work hard to keep it yours. We're going to talk about uh, 1031s, obviously, from uh, all the basic perspectives. We're going to talk about Section 121. We're going to talk about converting investment property to a residential property, why you do that. We're going to talk about converting residential property into investment property and why you do that. So uh, anyway, it's great information. Hopefully, you're going to get a lot of uh, good ideas out of it or at least a few little nuggets of knowledge. And uh, as always, if you've got questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, they're on the right side of the screen there. There's a little section with a question section. Uh, I'm going to be speaking, if you've been to our presentations in the past, I typically speak very quickly. And I jokingly say it's, it's sort of my, uh, my job to give you the ideas, give you an idea of what you can and can't do and also sort of confuse you enough to the point where you know you need me. But uh, the, the main thing is if you got questions, as always, please feel free to reach out. If we don't get to it today during the presentation, send us an email, go through stuff. If you happen to be in Oregon uh, and you would like CE for this, if you're a real estate professional, uh, please reach out to cmore, C-M-O-O-R-E at 1031exchange.com and she will work with you to get your continuing education taken care of. So uh, anyway, thanks again for joining and uh, away we go. I guess the first thing I'd like to say is, is and, and here we are, it's, it's uh, middle of May and, and we've got another wonderful day on Wall Street. And if we talk about things and investments, we talk about the Wall Street world. Obviously, we've all seen advertisements for gold, silver lately. We've seen or heard radio ads for it. And I, I just sort of throw it out to you. You know, what, what are they selling? They're selling a tangible asset, which is considered an inflationary hedge. And I would say real estate's the ultimate tangible asset. Therefore, it's the ultimate inflationary hedge. So uh, days like today where we've got a real uh, red day on Wall Street, that's where the, there's a flight to hard assets and, and uh, real estate, I think, is the ultimate hard asset. And if you've been to our presentations in the past, you've heard me say that, uh, you know, why or ask why real estate is considered an alternative an asset in the, in the investment field. And, uh, you know, for that matter, any tangible asset is. And, and I think it's sort of ironic that the most time tested, oldest investments knowing to mankind are all considered alternative investments. And we've got, you know, other things like the synthetic derivatives that got us in trouble uh, during that last crash are considered, you know, le legitimate investments. So I, I, I just don't like the, the whole uh, alternative investment term. I, I think it seems like it, it sort of uh, devalues these things that are such hard, time-tested assets. So I like to say real estate is a real investment. Uh, why, why would you think about real estate today? You buy precious metals, you're betting that they're going to go up in value. And, and if you look at what they are quoted at and what you actually can get for them when you go to sell them, it's two totally different things. But, you know, real estate, you're not banking on appreciation. Uh, the gentleman that mentored me when I got started in investment real estate, you know, basically, you know, taught my brother and I do not bank on appreciation. So we were always told, hey, what do you answer three questions before you buy something? What am I going to make? How am I going to make it? When am I going to make it? And if I can't answer the questions, don't buy it. But you have this investment plan when you're making that, that initial investment. And, you know, the other thing I'd say is you, you think about the you know, credit investor rules today. And a few years ago, they took your primary residence out of out of your quote unquote net worth for credit investor requirements. And I really think that's a sad deal because I, I would argue that for most people, their home is the best investment they've ever made. A second home is 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 another great investment for somebody to make. And then you've got the investment real estate. But you know, second homes for a long time were something that were excluded from 1031 or, or not excluded. I shouldn't say they were excluded, but there were people in the tax and legal community who said that, well, gee, they're not an investment. And I would argue the opposite. And a few years ago, we, we finally got guidelines for second home exchanges. 
they're not pretty, but uh, you know, they talk about what has to happen for a second home to qualify for 1031 purposes. But regardless, if we look at real estate, why, why real estate, why today? And as I said, you're not banking on appreciation, you got cash flow, somebody else, if it's an income property, somebody else is buying that thing for you. Uh, you're probably gonna have some cash flow on that thing that's coming to your pocket. Uh, you can leverage those investments. You've got interest deductions, mortgage pay down, depreciation. Appreciation at the end of the day is always going to be there. I uh, unfortunately a few months ago lost uh, one of my uh, nearest, dearest old friends. And, you know, he said there was one golden rule to investment real estate. And that is do not sell it in a recession. And, and that was it. Basically, he, he would also state that, you know, real estate's not a get rich fast scheme it's it, it's a get rich slowly but surely scheme so you know old mr nelson the 1031 guru i thank you for those words of wisdom i miss you uh and uh hopefully you you're up there looking down on us uh, smiling right now so i'm sure you are that's the way you are so anyway get rich slowly but surely so what is gain? Uh, and I really want you guys to think about this because gain has absolutely nothing to do with profit. Gain is simply a tax calculation. Gain is the difference between the adjusted sales price and the basis on your property. Your basis on the property is what you paid for it plus capital improvements minus depreciation. Uh, but that, that, that purchase price can vary dramatically depending on how you bought the property. If you pull money out of your pocket to go buy the property, that purchase price is a purchase price. If you inherited a property, you got a stepped up basis, current market value, whatever the property is worth the day you inherited, that's, you know, that was that initial quote unquote purchase price. If you're uh, gifted something, then you're gonna, you know, you're gonna receive that property at the basis as a person that granted that gift to you. If you've done 1031 exchanges through the years, those are basis carry forward transactions. It's a tax deferred exchange, it's not tax free. So whatever gain you deferred out of one property, that gain gets carried forward in the next property. If you had a primary resident, now think about it. A lot of times people's first investments are home and then they move out of that home, they get married, they have a kid, They're that, now that home's too small, they keep the home and, and, and rent it out, out for a period of time. We're gonna talk about converting assets, but, uh, if we look at if we look at a home and we think about so I've been doing exchanges for you know over 31 years at this point. In 1997, we had section 1034 was replaced with section 121. 1034 was the old residential rollover. As 1031 is a basis carry forward, 1034 was sort of a basis carry forward situation too. 1033 is another one where you can have that basis carry forward. 1033 is involuntary conversion. If some state, you know, municipality takes a property, uh, they're typically going to give you that 1033 option, which is very attractive. If you've got the option to go on 1033 or 1031, please do 1033. I, I know I just took money out of my pocket, but, but the, the bottom line is 1033 is a better deal for you. You got more time to bury the money. Uh, you don't you, you actually take the funds you don't have to spend all the equity and it's just a more attractive thing but once again 1033 is a basis carry forward so when 1034 the old residential exclusion uh, you know was there you or you had uh, when you sold your home you had two years to buy a new home and be greater value and uh, if you're 55 or older you had a one-time lifetime exclusion a gain of one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars now, I would argue that the 250 or 500 that 121 has today is probably not as good as the 125 was back in, in uh, you know, pre-97. And there's probably an argument that, that, that should be out there that, uh, you know, that, that 250 or 500 is now a million, million five or something like that. Uh, just to, if you think of what's happened over the last couple of years with, with real estate and now with inflation hitting everybody, that 250 or 500 is woefully inadequate and that's why we're going to talk about converting a primary residence into invest or you know into an investment property and using 1031. So we'll talk about that in a while. But you know, once again, that acquisition price varies depending on how you got the property. <clears throat> Excuse me. Capital improvements during the time you've owned the property. You know, you, you can't own a property for 10 years without putting anything into it. If you if you do that, you're, you're going to have a property that's eroding and in value and, and occupancy, but uh, you're gonna spend money on the thing. So every dollar you put into a property, you're either expensing or capitalizing, if you expense it, you write it off, doesn't impact your basis, you capitalize it, increases the basis. 
So I'll ask people during the last 10 years, you owned this thing, you did all this work, you know, what did you do with it? Did you, did you expense it or capitalize it? And, and they'll say, well, I did all these things. And well, yeah, I did all this work and I wrote it all off. Well, it didn't impact your basis. So capital improvements should be an increase in that basis number. Uh, if you expense those items, you're, you're not going to have an increase in the basis. Now we get to depreciation, and, and depreciation is one of those things where the government looks at it and say, you should have taken it, therefore you did. And, and what I mean by that is if you've got a property, you're renting it out, then you're, you're required to take depreciation. And you might say, well, gee, I never took it. I do my own tax work. I never took the depreciation, therefore I'm not on the hook for it. Well, if you got audited, the government's going to come in and say, gee, no, you should have taken depreciation, therefore you did. You're going to pay tax on depreciation recapture that you never had the benefit of. So, which leads me to this. We are just one member of a successful team of investment professionals for you. You want the best team you can possibly get. You're going to have title escrow people you work with day in, day out, critical to any successful investment. Good, competent tax and legal people, finance people, property managers you know you're going to have a team of people the brokers that are involved with the transaction all these people it's a complicated world these days so take advantage of the professionals in your life and let them do their job and, and you do your job take care of what you need and you're going to be happier that way so when we talk about tax work i, I really cannot stress enough that i think good tax people are are some of the most critical people in your life you really need good tax people that are going to be there going to help you get where you want to be and they're going to be there if you're ever unfortunate enough to be audited they're going to be standing there next to you and they're going to help you get through that thing and, and, and justify and rationalize what's been done with the property or your investments or your just life uh, over time so when people are you know asking me when i'd like to think have them think about an exchange i typically tell them when they buy the property just because ownership is going to dictate what happens in the future but you know they need to at least think about it when they go to consider a sale. You, you want to talk to your tax people, be armed with the information, understand what the tax liability is going to be on a potential disposition, whether it's your home or an investment property or anything, so you can really be prepared for any tax consequence that might be there. The 250 or 500 that Section 121 offers, uh, as I stated earlier, is woefully inadequate in today's world. So there's lots of people that will sell something and they feel trapped or they don't realize that they're going to have tax exposure on these things. And you really need to be aware of that. And the best way to be aware of that is by talking to your tax people and getting those numbers. And that way you're prepared with the information that's going to arm you uh, with the ability to make intelligent decisions. So basis is the purchase price, capital improvements minus depreciation. You're going to subtract that number from the adjusted sales price and that's going to give you gain. Now, about in the middle of this page, it says in bold, it says phantom gain. Now that is something that is very ugly, all right? Phantom gain is a situation where if you've got a debt over basis, uh, let, let's say you have a property that's in foreclosure, for example, and, and uh, so you say, well, gee, I, you know, I lost all my money. I, I got nothing. How can I have a gain in this transaction? Well, if the debt exceeds the basis in the property, the difference between the debt and that basis is gain. So on a primary residence, you've got some tax relief in that situation. But during the last crash, lots of investors got rude awakenings when they found out that they lost a property foreclosure or short sale and have to pay tax for the pleasure of doing so. So it's really important that you look at these things and understand gain has nothing to do with profit, gain's a tax calculation. And even with a total loss, you could be subject to that gain. And this is why you want great tax people in your life to help you get away from that ultimate tax liability. And, and Section 121 is a, a tool to keep that uh, from happening. 1031 is a tool to keep that from happening. 1033 might be. But you know these things are all things that are there to isolate you from gain with an exclusion or give you a basis carry forward through a transaction with tax deferral. And you know these things are here. 1031 is over 100 years old at this point. So it, it's not something that's new or risky. It's something that's time tested and proven. Uh, 121, like I said, came into play in, in 1997, replacing Section 1034. So you've got gain. What does it actually cost you? Uh, 
once again, not a pretty situation and it just gets worse. I really get tired of people talking about, well, uh, the rich have to pay their fair share. Well, how many times do you want people to pay tax on their money? They pay tax on the money when they, they make it, they pay tax on money in a lot of states when they buy things, they pay tax on stuff. If it's real estate, you're paying tax, property taxes on the property the entire time you own it. Uh, you, if you don't do an exchange or you don't fit the exclusion, you're gonna pay tax on disposition. And then when you pass away, you get to pay tax again. But uh, you know, it's sort of a crazy thing. But the numbers on this page are long-term capital gains tax consequences, all right? So if we're looking at a, an acquisition disposition inside a year with an investment property, or you're holding a property for, uh, let's say, resale, uh, you're flipping properties. You're going to pay normal income tax on those on those transactions. You're going to in ex you're probably looking at an aggregate tax in excess of 50% on those transactions. That's a hard pill to swallow. If you're looking at things at a long-term capital gains tax rate, that's what this page covers. Uh, understand what you make on this things, put on top of what you made in a given year. And it, you know, typically, I mean, there are lower tax brackets, but typically we're looking at these tax brackets on dispositions of real property with our clients. Federal tax rate of 20% on appreciation, 25% on depreciation recapture. State taxes are gonna be on top of that. I believe the next slide shows a map of, of different states with different taxes. And I, I just you know want to point out you, you you're going to add you know another 10 percent a lot of times on top of the federal tax in that situation. We still have the health care tax too if you're lucky enough to be subject to that another 3.8 on top. So you're looking 35 to 40 percent a lot of times even on long-term capital gains tax consequences on a disposition of a property. So it's really critical you sharpen your pencil with your tax people, understand the tax liability, and then start looking at the different tax codes and where you're going to go, how we can keep your money yours. But you know, years if I go back 30 years ago, I, I remember a presentation where somebody was saying, well, gee, you know, you, 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 it's your patriotic duty to pay tax in America, right? I mean, you, you've made all this money, you've had the benefits of, of living in America, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, you know, you shouldn't have to, you shouldn't do a 1031 and, and uh, you should pay the tax. Well, I disagree. Keep exchanging and exchanging and exchanging. You're going to increase your, your, in your ultimately your, your gain just continues to increase. And the uh, you know, you, most patriotic thing you can do is probably keep exchanging. But, uh, you know, at the end of the day, uh, you're either going to sell taxes and, and recapture that gain, or at least in today's world, I have to be careful with this one because every few years the government comes back and wants to eliminate the stepped up basis. If you swap till you drop, for example, you can you know, exchange throughout your life. When you pass away, you become an angel. Your heirs get those properties at stepped up basis, current market value. They could sell immediately after inheritance with no tax consequence. That's the law today. Once again, it's May of, of uh, 2022. Things change. And, and while I'm on the topic of change, I don't want to you know, throw out any uh, you know, scare tactics out here at this point, but I'm really getting tired of this after working in this space over 30 some odd years, fighting the government on 1031's uh, survival. And yes, uh, we, we just uh, survived uh, an attack couple of last year, for example, and now in Biden's 2023 budget, he's also put a cap in 1031 deferral at a half million per person per year. Yet again, here we go again, fighting for survival. So if you're interested in helping us fight that thing, and, and you know, there's two sort of schools of thought right now. One is that there's no way in heck it's going to go anywhere. There's too many things happen with midterms. And nobody's going to be pushing more problems out there. Uh, the other side is, hey, what do they have to lose? So just be aware that thing's out there. And uh, yet, yet again, they're floating it. And uh, you know, I don't know how many times we have to show the federal government that elimination of 1031 is actually a net loss. You know, it, it's a loss of tax revenue for them. Because you think about one real estate transaction. If, if you stagnate the... The, the real estate world by putting higher taxes into dispositions, people are not going to pay that tax. They're going to hang on to things. They're going to do cash out refis, move money that way instead of selling things. And uh, you know, one real estate transaction has a whole slew of people being paid that are paying normal income tax. Think about the brokers, the title escrow, the tax and legal, the finance people, property inspectors, appraisers, Home Depot for goodness sake, contractors. You know, when was the last time a property was sold where the buyer didn't improve it? 
So we want to make sure that the market allows property liquidity and things are going to be moving. It's just better for everyone. It keeps the real estate more vibrant. And uh, ultimately, you know, it helps government with tax revenue. So if they want to put something in that eliminates 1031, they're going to stagnate that market flow. And it's ultimately a big old loss to them. I don't know how many times we have to show them that. So enough on that page. What's your tax hit? Okay, where do you live? Now, if we look at these higher, you know, the, the, the dark colored states are the highest tax states. The light states are the states that people are all going to buy at. The other thing that's interesting, if we look at, you know, for example, Texas, Florida, uh, you know, Tennessee, these places are, are, you know, there's lots of money heading in those places too. I mean, we look at the entire West Coast, for example, we have common issues there. I mean, Washington State's banded because there's some things that have capital gains tax and some things that don't. For now, real estate's exempted from the, the newly imposed capital gains taxes in the state of Washington. Uh, so it would be uh, you know, a gray state as far as real estate is concerned. Uh, but we've got so much rent control in some of these states and, and with the additional state taxes and other things that are coming into place, we've got so much money. Individuals are just leaving those states. We've got institutional money. Everything sold is purchased by somebody. But uh, we've got lots of people heading to states where, where they have little to no state tax and also it's much more attractive to them. It's much more landlord friendly uh, instead of you know, giving all rights to the tenants and having the landlords have absolutely no rights and all the liability and all the risk. So I think this uh, map pretty much states it. If it's a light colored state, those things are more popular right now. And that's where the money's flowing. So, Section 121, the universal exclusion, as I said, it came into play in 1997. Uh, at that point in time, it was much more attractive than the old 1034 was. It gave an individual $250,000 exclusion on gain. A married couple got a half million dollar exclusion on gain. To qualify, you have to have lived in the property for two out of the preceding five years. You can do one exclusion. Uh, every two years. Now that's not an absolute. You could have multiple sales as part of one action. So let's say you've got a house and you you break off a piece of the backyard and now you sell that backyard in one sale, the home in another, both those sales could qualify towards the exclusion. More often than not to, in today's world though, you're gonna break that back piece off, do 1031 with it and then take the exclusion on the primary residence just because the gains are probably gonna be in excess of the 250 or 500. The other thing that you gotta understand is it's not an elective proration. You can't say, gee, you know, I've got a situation where uh, I bought the property a year ago. Hey, the gains have gone up. I want to just want to sell it uh, early and, and take the full exclusion. You don't get prorations based. It's not an elective proration. It's a situation where in hardship you can do a proration on it. So uncontrollable job changes, health something else, maybe, uh, you know, you're in the military, you, you get sent off, those things are gonna allow you prorations, but it's not an elective proration, all right? So, uh, you know, be aware of that. It, it, COVID, for example, people bought properties, things changed. 1031, I hear people say all the time, well, the code says, hey, you gotta hold it a year, or you gotta hold it two years, you gotta hold it five years. There's no stated black and white hold in the code. It, it's really discretionary in section 1031. 121, like I said, the rule is two out of the preceding five years. What I want to leave you with, though, is it you know, section 121. It's not what the property is at time of disposition. It's whether it fits a two out of five. So, you know, let's say you have a home, you move out of it uh, and you start renting that property out. As long as you've got the two out of five, you're going to be good, meaning that you could rent the thing for just shy of three years. So you've got to get a close within three years of moving out. As long as you do so, you're still entitled to 250 or 500. So we have lots of people that these days have gains in excess of 250 or five. They come to us, we tell them move out of the property. They season it as an investment. Uh, we'll talk about hold periods in a few, few slides. But you know, the idea is, hey, you can convert the asset and move out. If you're a broker, for example, you take a listing on this thing and you're walking through the property and you think, well, gee, this is an investment property. And uh, you know, talk to them, ask, hey, did you ever live there? If so, how long ago? And, and if they did live in it, 
and you're now two years into that three-year period after they moved out or two and a half years into it, you know, you got six months to get rid of this thing where they're still entitled to the exclusion. So timing is everything in these transactions. Ask the questions, talk, understand what's possible. You know, and, and obviously the title of this is, you know, what, what are you selling? What do you want it to be? Because we've got the ability to season things, move things, as I said earlier, from investment to residence or residence into investment. And there's reasons to do both of these things. So once again, Section 121 is not what something is at time of disposition. It's whether it fits a two out of five. And we, you know, you might have a situation where you've got a single asset without allocations, different directions, too. 1031 is a hundred, over 100 years old at this point, all right? And we used to be able, I, I mean, those of you that know me, I, I like fast stuff, right? I mean, I, I like cars, I like planes, I like boats, all that stuff. Uh, we, we used to do a lot of high-end cars, and, and that was a lot of fun for me as a fan of high-end cars. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, we lost personal property transactions in 2017's tax reform. I think we lost it because it was, you know, those horrible one percenters that owned those things that were doing the exchanges of, you know, aircraft and 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 artwork and and uh, we on, on the other side we lost businesses too. So if you've got a business you're you're relinquishing, if you've got a you know a, a, an aircraft, something else, personal property wise that, that you're going to trigger a tax consequence on. Where you want to look at this point in time, 1031's gone, it's out of the option uh, menu for you. You're going to look at a QOZ or an OZ, a qualified opportunity zone or an opportunity zone. And I sort of look at those as a, a sort of like a Roth conversion, right? You've got limited deferral into the investment, but if you hold the investment till maturity, you're going to have tax-free gain on that ultimate disposition. Uh, it, it's a complicated topic if you want to know more about it. Take a look at our YouTube channel. Just go in, type in uh, Equity Advantage uh, QOZ or Opportunity Zone. And you're going to see a whole series of videos with a you know a lawyer that uh, specializes in that uh, space, and it talks about it. We are actually going to do an updated uh, video series on that. Maybe, who knows? Maybe if it's something you guys would like to see, let me know. Maybe we set up a a uh, webinar on the topic too. But that's where you're that's where you're going to be looking at with respect to uh, alleviating tax consequences on personal property. You can also look at immediate expensing of acquisition stuff. Once again, good tax people are gonna be critical there. But 1031 today applies to property that's been held for investment and you know, applies to property acquired with the intent to hold for investment. Now we have an issue, if you look at that application for certain partnerships, partnership interests are specifically prohibited from 1031 treatment. So what I mean by that is that if you know let's say a group of us go out and buy a you know a large business complex okay we're probably going to own it as a limited liability company now what i say at the top of the seminar i said you know if you ask me when i'd like to talk to you about an exchange i'm going to tell you when you can contemplate a a purchase and and because i'm going to have that conversation it's like look the group of us buy the building as an llc what do you think the odds of all of us owning that property or wanting to own the property in five or ten years is probably slim to none so when we go to sell that property, do you think we're all going to go forward together? Probably not, too. Uh, so you know, when a limited liability company owns the asset and it's a multi-member limited liability company, you don't own the property. The LLC does. You own a membership interest in it's a legal partnership, and your interest cannot be exchanged. The entity can do an exchange, but your interest cannot, which ends up taking us to what's called a drop and swap or swap and drop where we drop your ownership out of the llc into a tenancy in common uh, ownership and then we take your piece going where you you want to go and obviously that quote unquote drop has to occur in accordance with you and your tax counsel's guidance because you know once again the vulnerability is if that drop happens as the deals in escrow you've got vulnerability there because you personally didn't hold the property for investment predisposition so that's just one of those complications the other thing you just got to be aware of is uh 1031 applies to domestic property for domestic property foreign for foreign you can't go domestic to foreign or foreign to domestic so just keep that in mind too so you can't go and take the money and, and go buy in the in the bahamas uh selling in texas all right 
but it's it's like I said, it's a hundred years old at this point. The last time we had the formalization of the code in '91, it allowed direct dealing and a variety of other things to happen. We have uh, sort of massaging of the code every few years. In 2000, we got formal guidelines on the reverse exchanges, and later we got the second home transactions. But you know, things get sort of refined through time. But you know, in essence, it's it's really pretty much remained the same since 1991. These are things that drive me crazy because people come in all the time. They say, well, I've heard this or I've heard that. And this is the way it is. And, and my father used to say, you know, anytime you know something about what you're reading about, you find out, you realize how wrong it is. So these are things that sort of come up day to day in my conversations. And uh, people, you know, I always joke when, when I started this company, I actually had hair on my head. You know, my brother still got hair on his head, but I don't know why it's impacted me. But uh, Anyway, in this situation, uh, you know, people comment, well, I remember when it's house for house, land for land, blah, blah, blah. It's never been that way. Okay, Like kind refers to the nature of the investment rather than the form. So that's wrong. It's never been that way. And hopefully it never becomes that way. Now, what's sort of ironic, and we'll talk about like kind in a little bit, but what's ironic to me is, is we had... Uh, I can't remember now, it was probably in the late 90s, there was a proposal out there would have, that would have eliminated the ID period, but it was bundled with a true uh, similar in service and use like kind requirement. So like kind today refers to nature of investment rather than the form, and they wanted to bundle the elimination of the 45 days, which has been wonderful, but they were gonna bundle that with a, a refinement and a much uh, tighter requirement for like kind. And the idea at that point was they, they saw the, the, the government saw farmland being purchased by, you know, let's say, you know, the one percenters that wanted to buy it to hunt on or just hold and enjoy or just whatever. They wanted to you know, hoard that land and they didn't want to have that farmland being taken out of production. Well, you know, fast forward 20 some odd years and, you know, hey, read the news. Look who's buying all our farmland and sort of taking it out of production. And, you know, that, it, it's happening. It, it, you know, it needs to stop. But yeah, anyway. That's another conversation. So, you know, they, they saw it, they were aware of the vulnerability, they, they proposed a change because they wanted to keep that farmland in the farmland, but really it would have stuck to the farmers because at the end of the day, farming's a very, very hard, hard business. And a lot of those people, you know, at the end of the day need to have the ability to, if, if they need to sell the farm, they, they should be given the opportunity to sell that thing. And, and by the way, while we're on that topic, you sell a farm, what are you selling? Well, if you live there, you're going to have the home portion. We're going to talk about single assets allocation to different direction, but you'd have the farmhouse, which is going to go section uh, 121, and you've got all the working land. It's going to go 1031. So you've got a single sale with allocations to different directions. Number two, section 1031 does not require two year hold. Okay, people say all the time, well, code says you got to hold it two years. In a related party transaction, there's a two year required hold. And even in that, if you read the fine print, uh, the, the, the fine print states, unless there was no intent to avoid tax. Well, you're going to see in, in, in tax law that rarely is in black and white, lots of gray, uh, and then that's one of those gray things. So there's no stated required hold in section 1031. Required party transactions have, or related party transactions have a two year hold. But, uh, you know, other than that, it, it's not there. If you wanted to acquire a property and convert it to your primary residence and then later sell it, uh, there is a five-year hold in that transaction uh, or it could be a fully taxable sale. We'll talk about that a little bit later when we talk about the Housing Assistance Tax Act. So, no two-year hold. Uh, three, there is no limit to the number of properties to relinquish or receive. A lot of times people say, well, the code says three properties. No, that's one of three different identification rules, and each identification rule works independently of the others. The three property rule is just one of them. So there is absolutely no restriction on the number of properties that can be exchanged in a given year. Now, what the government does not want to see you doing is you know we all hear the ads for flipping property flipping property is a business flipping property does not qualify for 1031 and no matter how long it takes you to flip that thing you're looking at normal income tax so in that context you know we it doesn't fit 1031 but if we're looking at if you've got a hundred properties in a portfolio let's say and you want to get rid of all of them and exchange combine them into one or combine them into you know 100 replacement properties whatever it is you could do that 
Now, what they don't want to see you do is daisy chain transactions. They don't want to see you exchange out of property A into property B, hold it for a couple months, sell property B into property C, and keep being able to do an exchange. Now, there are situations where it's abbreviated holds. Once again, in COVID, we had that happen. We'll talk about seasoning in a little while, but I just want to stress there's no cap in the number of properties that you're dealing with in a given year. Four, you can carry a note or land sale contract. Now, in the last decade, we probably have not seen a lot of those. Now we're in a situation where we're probably going to see more of them again as, as lending tightens, as the interest rates increase, things tighten up a little. We'll probably see more seller carrybacks, uh, but it is possible to do an exchange with a note and trustee, all right, or a land sale contract. It's more complicated, but we can make it work. That's another seminar. We don't have time to talk about that today. But if it's a situation, make sure that you work with an economy that's comfortable handling a note and trustee transaction, and they're going to isolate you from constructive receipt, actual or constructive receipt of not only the cash proceeds, but that note as well. Five, you do not have to replace debt in a 1031. I don't know how many times people, even in a day, I have to deal with all right people are told all the time you got to replace the debt you don't have to replace the debt okay debt goes away two ways one by going down in value that triggers tax because you went down in value the other way debt goes away is by adding cash to a transaction and recessionary times typically what happens you've got a decrease in loan to value ltv and a lot of times you've got a corresponding decrease in equity and then you go to buy the new property and the lender saying hey you got to come out of pocket more money your ltv drops and you're reducing the debt. Well, you can offset mortgage boot, a reduction. Boot's anything you receive in an exchange that's not of like kind. You can reduce, you can offset mortgage boot with additional cash. You cannot offset cash boot with mortgage. So you can always add cash to a transaction. I have people ask me, it's like, look, I'm selling this property. I've got $100,000 in debt in it. I can't or I don't want any debt on the replacement property. Uh, so do I need to pay it off uh, predisposition? And the answer is absolutely no, you don't have to do that. Just show up at the purchase with $100,000 and buy the property outright and you're totally fine. So once again, you can offset mortgage boot, a reduction of mortgage with additional cash. You cannot offset cash boot with mortgage, meaning you can't say, gee, I'm going to increase the loan, walk out of closing with cash in a transaction, which leads me to <clears throat> number six. 1031 is not all or nothing. You don't have to hit that bogey number to be totally tax deferred. That bogey number I referenced to is whatever the adjusted sales price was on the relinquished property. If you had an adjusted sales price of a half million dollars and your basis is $250,000 and the perfect replacement property is $400,000, you're going to defer gain on the difference between the 250 and the four. You're going to have exposure on the difference between the four and the five. If that's comfortable and that's what you want to do, do it. If you want to take $20,000 out of the transaction, go take a trip, do it. You can only get that money at close or after you've acquired all property you have the right to buy. Now, you know, historically, if we go back in the early days, uh, if you set up an exchange with us and money came into us and you said, you know, let's say day 30 or 40, you, you wanted money, maybe we would have given you the money because our position was, hey, the government uh, is going to receive the tax revenue. They'd like to have that. What's the problem there? Well, we had a, you know, a, a, a letter ruling that came back years ago. Nobody in the exchange world is going to give you money outside what's called 1031 G6. And uh, I can't, honestly, I can't remember if I got a slide on 1031 G6 in here. But think about it. If you want to pull money out, you can only take it at close and it's it, it's got to be strictly excluded from the exchange so in our assignment agreement you tell us to go we're going to do an exchange agreement assignment agreement escrow instructions the assignment agreement is the document that allows us to assume all rights and obligations of, of our client as a seller the relinquished buyer the replacement property in the assignment agreement there's a blank asking whether they'd like to retain any taxable or potentially taxable proceeds you write in there you know, in this, in this example, 100K, you walk out of that closing with that money, all right? So 1031 is not all or nothing. Every dollar you spend over your basis represents tax deferred gain. Just understand what's, maybe have losses somewhere else to offset the gains. That's fine, do that. 
uh, you know, take take the boot uh, as much as corresponds with whatever losses uh, you may have in a given year, which once again brings me back to those tax people. Talk to them when you're contemplating a sale. Give them an idea of what you think the property is worth. Look at everything else you have in your life, and and don't call your tax people April 10th, uh, you know, and talk to them about this stuff. You know, talk to them before a year's end so that you can do tax planning and really let them do their jobs. So once again, 1031 is not all or nothing. Defer what you choose to defer. Understand you just pay tax or have tax exposure on any boot that's received. So this slide, every time you sell something, think about it. Look at this slide. What are you selling? It could be your home. It could be uh, an investment. Uh, if, if it's a product that was held for under two years as a primary residence, it's not going to fit 121. Or you could have Section 1033, or you could have dealer status property. But most of the time, you're going to have one of these two tax codes to work with. Now, 121, as I said, it's not what something is at time of disposition. It's anything that fits a two out of five. 1031 applies to what something is at the date it's disposed and the date it's acquired, all right? 1031 applies to property that's been held for investment and is acquired with the intent to hold for investment. Uh, 121 is a straight exclusion on gain of 250 or 500,000, all right? You sell the property, you get the money, you've got a straight exclusion of the 250 or 500. 1031 is a tax deferral transaction. Uh, if you have actual or constructive receipt of the funds, you've got a tax event. So at time of close, we actually are given the property. We sell the property. The deeds actually go straight from the taxpayer to the buyer and straight from the seller to the taxpayer, unless we're doing, a let's say, a warehouse transaction, reverse or improvement exchange. But um, 1031 is, is one of those things where it's a tax deferral transaction and we've got hard timelines. And like I said, it's not all or nothing. But it's got to be set up pre-close if you had to, if you have a closing and, and then reverses too. We're doing a lot of reverse exchanges today where we're buying for selling later. You have to have the exchange set up pre-close. If, if the thing closes and you own the property, legally speaking, you can't own the new and old property at the same time. So reverse exchange is a warehouse transaction where we're creating an entity, taking ownership of either the new or old property for a period of time. Uh, so Anyway, keep that in mind. Another example of warehouse transaction if we're doing an improvement exchange, building things out. Actually, back to that slide. Think about the example I gave you on the farms earlier. So we've got a single sale allocations, different directions, all right? Think about a duplex, half owner-occupied, half non-owner-occupied, same situation. Some of you out there, we've, we've got a lot of people out there today watching this thing. Think about it, if you're, if you're not working at home, through COVID, maybe you start working from home. I saw today that you know Apple was going to bring a whole bunch of people back uh, to the office, and then they've you know kicked that ball down the road again. So lots of people are working out of their home these days. Now you might meet with your tax bill, and your tax bill say, "Well, gee, you know what? You're working out of your home, uh, so let's treat that portion of your home as a home office, and and uh, it's going to help you out tax wise." Well, understand that a lot of times. You know, if, if you take advantage of one tax thing, you've got a corresponding problem someplace else. You start treating it as a home office. You start taking depreciation. You got to be careful how long you've done that. If you've been treating it as a home office for more than, let's say, that three-year period, now you sell your home. You thought, gee, it's all going to fit the 250 or 500. Now that piece of your home that was a home office has to be exchanged surprise all right so be careful on this stuff but you know typical examples duplex half owner occupied half non-owner occupied or a situation where we've got a large property we're going to have an allocation to the home portion and then the investment portion those allocations you, you, you're going to want to sharpen your pencil once again with your tax people take full advantage of the 250 or 500 that 121 offers and the overage would go 1031 for example so converting properties, and you've heard me talk about it a few times now, convert an investment to a residence, residence to investment, there's reasons to do both those things. Uh, it's not uncommon to do this. The government's actually put things in, in place, giving us sort of guidelines to do so. So if you're buying a property via 1031 and you ultimately want to convert that property to your primary residence, hey, it's a great idea, you can do that. It's not as, as good an idea as it was of between, uh, let's say, 1997 and 2000, uh, government saw too much money floating out the door, so they put some some rules in place we'll talk about in a minute. But, uh, you know, it, it, there's still reasons to do those things. 
So just as there's a reason to go from section 1031 to 121, I would argue that in today's world, the 250 or 500 in, in section 121 is woefully inadequate for many people when they sell their home. So as I stated earlier, if you talk to me, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you this as an option. Hey, move out of the house, establish that home as an investment property after, you, after a reasonable period of time, whatever you, you and your tax people feel is reasonable, you then sell the property. As long as you do it within three years of moving out, you're still entitled to 250 or 500. And then we're going to take and do all the overage via section 1031. And we've got actually, you know, uh, rev procs that, that guide us in that. So there's reasons to convert from investment to residence, residence into investment. It just takes time and seasoning. So once again, what is the property? What do you want it to be? Your next question, how long, well, David, what do you mean by that? How long is long enough? Well, on my fallacy page, uh, what I say, I, I said, there's no stated holds in the code. So if we're talking about buying something with the intent to hold for investment, uh, you know, it really has to do with circumstances, it has to do with, you know, what you do for a living. I look at this stuff and I still point back at the, uh, the Clarkowski court case, nine points used to determine dealer status. And those things, uh, those nine points revolve from everything from what you do for a living, how often you do in transactions, what your intent was when you bought the thing, what you do with the property during the time you owned it. Uh, you know, anyway, you, if you've got a strike or two against you, I don't really have a problem with it. Most of the time, especially when I, I'm dealing with somebody that's slipping properties, he's, well, no, this is an investment. No, it's not. I mean, you, you're buying something, all you're doing the entire time you own it is prepping it for sale. So uh, you and your tax people might might argue that you know a couple times, but uh, you know after that you're you're really you're you're sort of barking up the the, the, the wrong tree on that. So uh, seasoning, I would say a year based on two factors as long as it's not a related party transaction. The two factors I reference are one it's been one year's been proposed a couple times, and two you look at the break between short long term tax rates on assets held for investment. Without said. With that said, the recent case is a situation where somebody did an exchange, bought a property, held it for four months, moved into the property, got audited, taken to court, prevailed in court after a four-month hold, uh, arguing hardship. They, they documented the showings, documented the listings for rent, uh, argued that they couldn't, have, they couldn't rent it out, couldn't afford both the new and old property at the same time, decides to be easier to sell their home, moved in the investment property. So in this particular court case, four months was deemed long enough. Uh, you know, that's, that's up to you and your tax people, but, uh, you know, there are transactions where things are held less, where we have a seasoning issue typically. Now, the biggest headache I've got in the exchange is always going to be the timing that 45, 180 days gives us. The second biggest issue I've got is, is, is going to be this vesting component. And, and it comes back down to that example I gave earlier. If we buy this large business complex, we own it as an LLC. And I mentioned a drop and swap. So the deal is we can't do the exchange. The entity could do the exchange, but the members cannot go different directions. So we either do a drop and swap or a swap and drop. A drop and swap means we're going to Tennessee in common predisposition. A swap and drop means we're going to complete the exchange in the entity's name and then break uh, you know, the, the respective replacement properties into ownership of each of those particular owners' needs or desires in the future. So the big question is how far before disposition should that drop happen or how far after acquisition should the drop happen? And that's, you know, once again, a conversation between the taxpayer and their tax counsel. It's going to be sort of case by case situation. And, you know, you really want your tax people comfortable because if anyone ever questions it, you want everybody to be on the same page to build, defend what's going on. But, you know, a lot of times it's not the length of time you own something, it's the intent, what you're doing with it during the time you owned, owned it. Housing Assistance Tax Act, you, you heard me reference it earlier. I just love the way the government comes up with names for these things. Uh, Housing Assistance Tax Act of 2008, sounds like it's there to help us all and all it does is stick it to us. So, as I said, there was a gap between 1997 and 2000, let's say, where people were able to acquire a property, be a 1031, hold it a year, move into it, live in it for two, dump it, take the exclusion, get rid of all the gain. It was a beautiful thing. 
right? Right around 2000, we had a five-year required hold come into play. That slowed that process down. So if you acquired a property via 1031, converted it into a primary residence and sold it within five years of acquisition, it would be a fully taxable sale, okay? That didn't slow it down enough for the government. So what they did in 2008 is put the Housing Assistance Tax Act in place. It basically says, that you're going to get a proration of the 250 or 500 exclusion offers. You're never going to get the full 250 or 500. And that proration of the 250 or 500 is, is attributable to the amount, of pro, the, the amount of time the property is held via qualified use periods and non-qualified use periods. Qualified use for, for, the, for our purposes of discussion would be the time you live in it. Non-qualified use would be the time from uh, you know, let's say January 2009 to the date of conversion, that would be non-qualified use. So let's say you had a dozen years of non-qualified use and you had, you know, let's say four years of qualified use where you're going to get a third of the exclusion. The longer you live in the property, the more that ratio converts to a qualified use, the more you're going to be able to shelter via section uh, 121. But you know, really what I tell people today, even though it used to be a great idea, people come up with the idea all the time, think they're gonna get rid of it all. This prohibits you from taking full advantage of the 250 or 500. I tell people, look, if you're gonna do this exchange into the property, ultimately convert it into your residence, and you're gonna live there for, for the foreseeable future, do it. If you're doing that transaction with the idea, you're just gonna get rid of tax exposure, don't do it because it's not going to help you out. And by the way, during these seasoning periods, really understand what the tax liability is because during a seasoning, if you if you take a home and you convert it into an investment, uh, or or you're buying a property that ultimately you want to move into, there's a seasoning period there that's going to cause you some some expense. So depending on where you live, I mean, if you're living in Southern California, for example, you might be paying you know five, six, seven, eight, ten grand a month in rent. That adds up fast. That's going to eat up a lot of tax uh, deferral via these things. So you got to really weigh everything. Don't just look at the tax. Understand what the cost of getting away from that tax is going to be so you can really arm yourself with good, valuable information. The 1031 is not always the right thing to do. You got to really look at it. You know, if you're holding things, seasoning things, there's a cost to that seasoning period and you're putting your life on hold for a period of time. So make sure that you rationalize this and you're doing things to you know keep you where you want to go and keep you healthy and well uh you know at the end of the day you know i, I always like to say that that you know if you don't have your health you you don't have anything so you're you're all stressed about tax referral and putting your life on hold to do this stuff there, there's a cost there to you so make sure you weigh those things but if you if you're just hell bent on avoiding all or not avoiding deferring or you know avoiding tax liability then we can convert things. We can do things through seasoning periods. You just got to really, like I said, sharpen that pencil. Four basics of the exchange. Okay, I'm going to go through this real quick, then we're going to go through some examples that we're done. So I like simple. When I look at an exchange, four basic issues. You may or may not be aware of the fact that we've got a sister company, IRA Advantage, that does self-directed IRAs, 401k plans for people that typically want to go buy you know, real property with those things. Uh, doing a class on that tomorrow. So if, if you're interested, uh, you know, reach out, sign up for it. But uh, when I look at retirement accounts, I got two issues. What's the person want to buy and who are they transacting between or for the benefit of? That's what it really comes down to with a retirement account, whether somebody can or can't do something. In the exchange world, I got four issues. And you're going to say, that's six issues or 10 issues or three issues or whatever it might be. Everybody's got a different perspective on 1031. But I break it into four basic contexts. One, You've got to give us some, we've got to give you something back. It's got to be an exchange, all right? Two, what's relinquished and received have to be of like kind. Three, you've got to go across or up in value and equity. That's called the napkin test. And finally, we've got to have continuity of vesting. The biggest headache with any exchange is time. The second biggest problem is that vesting issue. So an exchange, what do I mean by that? You're going to give us something, we're going to give you something back. All right, a true swap's an exchange and you don't need us for that. So uh, if you've got something, somebody else has something, they're both of equal or greater, uh, of equal value and equity and you wanna swap right straight across, that's fine. If you look at purchase sale agreement, it doesn't say total cash paid for something, it just says total consideration. So, you know, consideration could be anything. 
but if, if you want to swap properties uh, and, and they're the same value and equity, then you can swap it. You don't need us for that. If, if you're doing a traditional delayed exchange, basically you're giving us a property, we're selling it, you can tell us what to buy, we buy it and give it to you. Reverse means we're going to buy something first and sell the relinquished property later. Uh, we can do that. An improvement exchange means we're going to buy something, build it out, and give it to you. As for holdbacks, do not qualify, by the way. Improvement exchange or reverse exchange is another class, once again. If you want information on those things, reverses we're very busy with right now. Take a look at YouTube. Once again, Equity Advantage, reverse exchange. There's a nice 12, 13-minute video on reverses. Anyway, it could be a swap, delayed, reverse improvement, or warehousing transaction. All these things are going to give you tax deferral, either full deferral if you're satisfying the napkin test or portions uh, to your desire. Like kind refers to the nature of the investment rather than the form. Any real property held for investment is like kind with any real property acquired with the intent to hold for investment. You can go from rental house into land, apartment buildings, place at the beach. All those things are gonna be of like kind. Uh, something I'll just mention because we've got a lot of money going into them right now is let's say Delaware Statutory Trust, acronyms DST. You gotta love DSTs, uh, the, the, the whole acronym world, right? But DST, there's something called Deferred, deferred Sales Trust too. Uh, but uh, DST is, is a Delaware Statutory Trust and, and it's a passive investment that is 1031 compliant. Lots of those are being done today. So if you are a property owner, you're sick and tired of the terrible T's, toilets, trash, tenants, turnover, and you don't want to pay the tax, well, exchange into a DST. There's things called an upread also, where you're basically buying an asset to read absorbs. You ultimately uh, end up owning shares of a REIT, and you pay taxes, you sell those shares. I look at those as sort of the ultimate installment sale. So anyway, those are, once again, other seminars. But like kind refers to the nature of the investment rather than the form. The napkin test, cross up in value and equity, that's what we care about. Anything that's received that's not of like kind, the exchange is considered boot and taxable. 1031 is not all or nothing. The value and equity numbers are net of closing costs. So if you wanna pull some money out and, you, and you're comfortable with that tax consequence, do it. Do it either at close or you can only get the money after you've acquired all property you have the right to buy. Vesting. Now, why is this such a problem? Uh, I would say those with the gold make the rules. That's that's a big issue because the, the finance world doesn't meet eye to eye with the tax and legal world a lot of time. We have to have a situation for the exchange, the taxpayer that relinquishes has to receive. Now, the problem can come up as a multi-member LLC and, and it can be as easy a problem as this. You know, let's say, for example, I'm sitting here in Oregon. Oregon's not a community property state. So in a non-community property state, two spouses are not, uh, if two spouses own property being a limited liability company, it's considered a partnership. So, you know, a lot of times, you know, spouses will buy a property, they buy another one, they buy another one, they meet with their lawyer, the lawyer says, gee, you know, you've got all these properties, you got liability, let's shove them into an LLC. Uh, and isolate you from that liability. So then they sell that property, the rental house or small plex, and they go to finance a new property that's four units or less, it's a residential loan, and uh, typical loan channels aren't gonna allow the LLC to take ownership, so now the taxpayer's upset because the loan's gonna cost more than what they wanted to have. So in a, a non-community property state, spouses giving up a property in LLC, they're gonna have to buy in the LLC that can't take ownership personally. If they're in a community property state, they can enter the exchange in an LLC, not only in spouses, for example. Uh, they could enter the exchange in the LLC and acquire the replacement property personally, personally or via the LLC. That's how easy it gets to be a problem. This is the flow of the transaction. Taxpayers up top, we're in the middle. They give us the property, we sell it to the buyer. The deed actually goes directly from the exchanger to the buyer, tell us what to buy. We buy it, we give it back to the taxpayer. Uh, ownership flows through us. The settlement statements are going to show that we're selling and buying. The taxpayer is signing everything read and approved as the exchange or the deeds typically go direct. Now, the only time we've got deeds that uh, we take ownership on stuff is in warehouse transactions once again. So in a reverse exchange or an improvement exchange, we literally take ownership via a limited liability company we're the sole member of. In a basic delayed exchange, we're not going to have that issue. 
Now we are hitting the one hour deal. We've got a few slides left. I apologize, uh, but we're gonna get through it pretty quickly. And I've got some great examples ahead. If you gotta go, I understand. Uh, but uh, if you can hang out, hang out for a couple more minutes. Timelines, 45, 180 days, both start at settlement and uh, no extensions short of a presidentially declared national disaster. So we had extensions during COVID. Typically we have uh, some type of extensions annually with tornadoes or hurricanes. We've had them for flooding. Uh, we had them uh, for fires. Uh, we had them for COVID. But uh, you know, pre 9/11, we never had one, and since then, uh, we have them annually for different regions of the country. You've got to show that you were directly impacted by that disaster. You can't just say, "Well, hey, there was," you know, you, you're in you're in California, disasters in Florida, you were impacted. Now, if you ID Florida property and it went away, that would be, you know, obviously something's there. Or let's, you know, let's say your accommodator is impacted by you know, a problem and they can't, uh, you know, they're not able to work, blah, blah, blah. That could, you know, give you an extension too. But anyway, typically you're, you're not allowed any extension short of a, a, a you know, declared national disaster. And uh, it, it, it's, it's not 45, 180, it's 45 with a total of 180. Be aware come year's end, you've got to complete your transaction pre-filing a tax return. So it's 180 days of the due date of your tax return. So make sure you, you complete the exchange prior to filing a return. If you're not going to get the exchange done until after April 15th, file an extension. ID, three property rule. So there's three options, the three property rule, 200% rule or 95% rule. Each rule works independently of the others. Identification does not mean you've got an offer pending. It just means you're giving what the government deems an unambiguous description. A common address would work as long as it includes city, state, and zip. Uh, if you're gonna buy a portion of something, you need to identify the portion you intend to buy. Don't ID the whole thing and pick up 20%. You didn't receive substantially the same thing. If you ID the whole thing and pick up 60%, you can probably argue and successfully defend that. But make sure you, you know, identify the approximate portion you intend to buy. If you're doing an improvement exchange, you're going to ID the property and the improvements you intend to create on that property. So, uh, you know, it's three property rule. 200% rule means if you want to ID more than three properties, you can. Total value of the properties cannot exceed 200% of the relinquished property's value. Third rule says you can exceed three, can exceed 200%. You got to close 95% of the aggregate value of all properties ID means you're buying literally everything you've identified. So it, it, it's a tough thing. I know a lot of great brokers, but I don't know many that want to tackle that 95%. Imagine you have one sale fail, fail, you lose the exchange. This is critical. When can I get my money? Now I refer, referenced it earlier, but I just want to stress because in today's world, it's a great time to sell. It's a hard time to buy. So you need to know that you can only get the money under what's called 1031 G6. All right. So that means that you can get the money at close if it's excluded from the exchange. If you're working with us, we're gonna exclude it via our assignment agreement. We're gonna sign everything but X as the money you wanna receive. If the money comes to us, you can not receive the money for any reason inside the 45 day ID period. After the 45th day, you can receive it after you've acquired everything you have the right to buy. So if you're banging up against the 45th day and don't just ID a property just in case, because imagine if you find the property you really want on day 60, you identified property you don't really want, I can't legally give you your money till day 181. So make sure that you're identifying only what you wanna buy. If we're banging up against 45 days and you're sure you want this property, but you might, you know, idea fall back uh, two or three properties whatever might be the case in our, our id form you, you're going to fill out that form put the value the properties on the values the property and and there's a little blank in there that says you reserve the right to buy blank of these properties the reason that blanks there is because if you id three properties you might be iding three with the intent to buy three or you might be iding three with a primary and two fallbacks well, if you buy that primary and you, and you said, well, gee, I've got $20,000 left in the account that I want to just take, uh, if you don't put and restrict, if you ID three and you put in that blank that you only have the right to buy one, as soon as you buy that one, any residual proceeds that are in the account and we're outside the 45 days, I can give you that money. Now, if you don't restrict it, if you ID three and you don't put any restriction on the number you're gonna buy, now I can't give you the money till day 181. So that's just something to be aware of. It's something that, Nobody in the exchange world 
that does this professionally is going to give you money outside 1031 G6. If you're working with a company that's going to, uh, you know, th their policies, procedures are, are, are really vulnerable. Uh, so, you know, make sure you understand what's going on with that and, and, and fit within these rules because it, it's critical that if you want money out, have the discussion with your accommodator and understand when you're going to have access to that money. All right. Now, the exception to this is, let's say you identify a, a single property and it's got an extreme material, material defect. Let's say that they cook the books on the numbers or maybe it's a gas station, you got gas tank leaks, that type of stuff. That's an extreme material defect. Maybe you've got a, a situation where you know, you've know you got lot lines you thought were one thing and you have it surveyed and it's something totally different. That could be an extreme material defect and you, you could have access to the money in those situations. End game, swap till you drop, exchange into a retirement residence. Uh, exchange until it takes, uh, makes tax sense, exchange no passive investment, the DSTs we talked about, installment sales, structured sales, deferred sales, trust, CRTs, gifting. Now, in games, like I said, installment sales are, are, are a great thing. If you don't want property anymore and you want just income over time, I got a couple comments for you. One, understand the tax liability when you relinquish this thing. Now, a couple of days ago, I did a presentation for this big investment firm, and you know, people like to talk about these nothing down transactions. Well, hey, that's a great thing, but you better have enough money if you're a seller, you better get enough of down payment to pay, pay, pay the escrow officer, pay the broker. Uh, if you're doing exchange, I'd like to get paid, but you know, make sure you got enough money to cover all your closing costs. The other thing you gotta be aware of is, that in an installment sale, you're going to have tax exposure on debt relief and depreciation recapture in the year of the sale. Okay, it doesn't matter if you got the payments or not, you've got exposure on those things. So, you know, somebody comes in with a great idea of nothing down transaction, uh, which is not new, by the way. I mean, Robert Allen, I remember in the 70s, I wrote a book, Nothing Down Robert Allen, that was the golden book in those days. And, and yeah, you can do deals and people do it today. But if you're a seller, you got to understand where you're going to have some tax exposure. So make sure you get enough of down payment to cover the closing costs and any tax obligation you might be facing if you just want an installment sale over time. Structured sale is basically an institutional installment sale, and it can be tailored to any period of time you want. My final comment on the installment sale is make sure uh, that you've got some type of acceleration provision in there if it's something that you want to make sure goes. If you, if you got a 10-year term on it, uh, you and you're depending on 10 years of income, you better have some type of acceleration provision in it. A few examples were done. So this is a situation where we've got that example I gave earlier. We've got a, a you know a farm property. The farmer sells the property. We've got an allocation the farmhouse section 121. The working land is going to go 1031. Uh, and, and these allocations, you know, work with your tax people on it. Make it fit your needs but this is a single sale with allocations different directions, keeping that tax, taxpayer's money theirs. Um, another transaction where people had doors, they got to a point where management was too much, they didn't want to go out and buy some passive investment, they just said, you know what, we've had this property for a long time, we're happy with what's happened, and we are going to do a partial exchange. So in this transaction, and this is, a, you know, these, these are real transactions. These are not just made up examples, but the, you know, these people decided, hey, we're gonna sell this $3 million multifamily project, and all we want is a million dollar property down in the desert. And so we did the exchange for them, and you're saying, well, gee, you know, the napkin test says cross are up in value and equity for total deferral, uh, yes. And, and, and like I said, 1031 is not all or nothing. So they had tax exposure on the difference between the 3 million and the 1 million. So they had 2 million in, in, in gain that was realized, but their basis was $250,000 on $3 million project. So they deferred the tax on the difference between the 250 and the million, which was 750,000 in gain deferred, saving a quarter million in tax. And they had tax exposure on the difference between the one and the three. They were comfortable with that. So buy what you want to buy. Just understand what the tax liability is. You maybe have losses elsewhere to offset the gains. I don't know, but but that was going to be what they wanted to do, and that's what they did. This is an example of sort of you know working with the ID rules, but this is a, a transaction where we so so the last slide was what conversion of investment to residence after acquisition. 
Okay, so they I, I didn't take it. So so further, what happened is the Palm Desert property, you know, after a qu acquisition, after a reasonable period, they converted it from investment to residence, and boom, got where they wanted to go. This slide talks about going the opposite direction. These people came to us, Los Gatos, California property, over $3 million in gain. The half million exclusion was going to do nothing. Some lawyers sent them to us. We said, move out of the house, which they did. They worked with their tax people, held it for a period of time, seasoned it as an investment. When they sold it, they take, took the exclusion. The balance of the money came into us via 1031. They bought 24 different replacement properties inside that 45-day period. The reason they closed them all inside the 45 days is... Uh, the husband was a lawyer, the wife was a CPA, she did everything, she knew the tax consequence of a failed exchange, she wasn't going to take that chance dealing with the 95% rule, so she got them all done inside the 45 days. So we went from a million dollar tax hit roughly to zero, and they got all those transactions out of it. I, I think that's a you know definitely a win-win situation. Uh, da -da -da -da. I've got this slide twice. I apologize, but you know, on the bright side, we're over time and I don't have to cover it again. Last example, curveball, nothing to do with exchanging, but sort of baits you to come, you know, listen tomorrow. Uh, it, you know, only dumb questions, one you don't ask, ask the questions. This, these people, husband and wife, and this does talk about, you know, sort of conversion of assets or working with different things they've got. Husband and wife retired, came to us uh, wanting to buy a mobile home RV park with their IRA accounts, and that is something we can help them with. So when they first inquired, I thought, well, gee, we'll do a checkbook IRA for them, uh, which in a nutshell means we're going to take his and her IRAs, uh, create an IRA-specific limited liability company. The trust company makes an investment in the LC, which then buys the investment. That would have worked as a pure investment. Well, as we talked, it turns out they wanted to live on the property and they also wanted to be the on-site managers to take compensation. Either one of those things by itself would have triggered prohibited transactions, would have blown up the entire IRA. So we had to shift gears entirely. We created something called a rollover business startup and that combines a 401k plan with a C corporation. So we created the 401k plan, the plan buys the corp, the corp bought the park, these people got an investment they got a job and a place to live all with this one transaction. I think that's a win, win, win. And it sort of is a great example of what is possible when you get that good team of people together. Thank you very much for joining us today. I hope you found it helpful. If uh, you have questions, uh, obviously I didn't have any time to get to them today. If you've got them on that sideband, we will be answering them. We'll get you answers back. If you want to give us a call, please don't hesitate to do so. You can reach us at 503-635-1031 or 800-735-1031. Once again, 503-635-1031 or 800-735-1031. We're happy to help you out. Uh, look forward to having the opportunity to talk with you and uh, best health to everyone out there and uh, look forward to having you join us again soon. David Moore, Equity Advantage, 1031exchange.com, signing off. One last comment, if you need uh, credit or you've got those inquiries, you can reach C Moore, C-M-O-O-R-E at 1031exchange.com. Thank you very much and all my best to all of you. Take care. David Moore signing off. Bye-bye.